Hi, my name is Dave Sebecki, and I'd like to talk to you today about active learning in a collaborative format. A little bit about me. After two years at Franklin and Marshall College in Lancaster, Pennsylvania, I spent 22 years as a professor at Miami University in Hamilton, Ohio. Just last year, I moved here to the Gulf Coast of Florida, where I'm loving life and taking a couple years off to focus on writing. I spent many, many of those years as a purely lecture style teacher. I'm pretty good at it. Evaluations were always good and students seemed to enjoy my act. But I also had the nagging feeling that I should involve students in class more. I just didn't really know how to do that effectively. Then I got involved in the Math Pathways movement and that work really evolved my perspective. Collaborative learning is really gaining steam in the world of college math. More and more emerging research indicates that traditional lecture models don't serve modern students very well in any area and certainly not in math. Technology is rewiring people's brains to learn much more effectively in an active setting and group learning is the ideal vehicle to achieve that goal. When I went to an active learning model in my non-STEM classes, I became a believer very quickly. And I'd love to share some of the things I've learned from my experience and also from talking to nice folks like you from all over the country. Without question, the first thing you need to know is that students don't know how to learn in groups in a math class. I can pretty much guarantee that left to their own devices, the vast majority will default to trying to work out problems on their own in silence. And they think this is what working together means. What did you get? We've all seen that happen, right? They're unlikely to think about discussing the process until there's a discrepancy in the answers. This, of course, totally misses the point and the greatest value of collaborative learning. It's our job to teach them how to learn in a group setting. At the beginning of a group-based class, you're gonna to have to be a little bit like this guy. You're going to have to do some selling. You gotta understand that students are funny. They're weird. After years and years of complaining about their math classes, when you put them in a math class where you're going to do something different, they complain about that. They say, well, this doesn't look like my other math classes. When you show them that they're going to work actively in groups and you're not going to just lecture them, their first instinct is, I'm paying you to teach me. I'm not paying you to make me learn by myself. So you really got to do a little bit of a sales job to convince them that, hey, this is the right thing for you. You're going to enjoy this more, and more importantly, you're going to get, get a lot more out of it than you have from your traditional math courses. At the beginning of a lot of courses of this type, people like to use one of these guys, an icebreaker. But what about if you use something that's better than an icebreaker? Something that gets the students talking and gets them to meet each other and get into the mode of working together in a non-math setting that's going to convince them hopefully that, hey, I see why this might be a good idea. Here's something I learned at a seminar one time and I think it's absolutely genius. At the beginning of the class, very first thing, introduce yourself, maybe make sure everyone's in the right class, and then just hand out a couple of riddles or a couple of puzzles. We've all seen things like that. They're easy to find online. There's tons of things like that. Hand them out and tell the students, you're not allowed to talk to each other. You have five minutes to work on these riddles, puzzles, get as many as you can, no talking and see how well they do in five minutes. And most of the time you're gonna find they don't do well at all. Then put them in groups. Doesn't matter how. Turn to your nearest four neighbors, sit in a circle, whatever. Say, all right, I'm gonna give you another five minutes to work on these things together, discuss them. I can almost promise you that unless you choose riddles that are really, really difficult, I can almost promise you they're going to do better. In many cases when this happens, almost none of the students will get any of them on their own and most of the groups will get almost all of them working together. And it's fantastic because it doesn't have anything to do with math, but it shows them right from the very first few minutes of the course, this is what you're shooting for. This is why working together actively in groups is a good thing because the collective wisdom of all of you is much greater than the learning capacity you have on your own. And talking, discussing, working through the process, bouncing ideas off of each other, brainstorming, brainstorming are all incredibly helpful in problem solving, which then gives you a wonderful opportunity to say, that's what this course is going to be about. It's not going to be about memorizing a bunch of formulas. It's not going to be about finding X. It's going to be about solving problems using mathematical tools and mathematical thinking. And you're going to be able to do that much more effectively if you can work effectively in groups. So you've got your class set up. 
You've done your selling job. You've convinced the students that, hey, this just might be a good idea. Then what do we do? Well, let's talk about class on a day-to-day -day basis. Here's a little quiz for you. What do I say most commonly in class? Is it? I should have listened to my mom and become a real doctor. <clears throat> nope, it's not that. This is an absolutely, honestly true story. My mom really, really wanted me to become a physician, and I had no interest in that. When I was working through grad school on my master's, I decided to go on and continue to work on my doctorate. I told my mom, Mom, I made a big decision. I'm going to go on and get my PhD in math. And she looked at me and said, Oh, David, you always take the easy way out, don't you? A little bit of Dave Sebecki history there. So that's not what I say most commonly in class. Is it? You guys are the best class ever. No, of course not. You can't let them get that comfortable. Is it? Dude, is that ringworm? Ew, just, ew, no. Or is it? Talk to each other, people. Ding, ding, ding. Yes, that is by far the most common thing that I say in every single session of my class. When things get too quiet, you know the students are not working the way they're supposed to. Certainly it's okay if they have occasional moments where everyone is working on some type of computation and then, you know, they're going to do a little comparing of answers, but that should not happen very often. There should be a lot of noise in the classroom. And if there's not, it's not going well. You'll find that students often take on roles within the groups. And that's a really good thing. I found it happens very organically. Usually there's going to be someone in the group who says, as they're working through questions, you know what, I'll read the question aloud. And then your job is to like write down all our answers and then make sure that everyone's on the same page, whatever. But if you need to convince students, if this doesn't happen organically, you need to tell students, hey, there should be roles that you take on. And one of them might be keeping everyone together and reading the questions aloud. And that's a really good thing because you wanna keep that interaction going. In that regard, it can be a little tough emotionally to teach this way, at least it always is for me, because sometimes this is the best approach. You just have to shut the hole under your nose from time to time. When I teach this way, I find, frankly, that there's a lot of times where I just kind of stand around and I don't really do anything because the students are working well. I might be texting my wife or checking my emails, and when I do that, I get this overwhelming urge to butt in because it's just the way I am. I worry that students are looking at me out of the corner of their eye and thinking, just look at him, not doing anything. I can't believe he gets paid for this. And that really bothers me. But the truth is that when the students are working well enough that I don't need to intervene, I could be standing on my head or juggling chainsaws and most of them wouldn't notice. And that's a great thing. Part of the art of teaching in this way is getting used to recognizing when students could use some help. When you hear something that seems incorrect or when a group appears to be not getting along well or when a group appears to be too quiet, sometimes it's a good idea to just check what they're doing, give them suggestions. If there's someone that's not participating in the group, I'll often just walk over and say, you know, Mary, what do you think about this? What are you having trouble with? Just to foster those interactions. But don't overdo it. Part of this is letting the students work together and ask you when they need help. Speaking of which, Physical proximity matters in a group class. It's absolutely fascinating to me. And, and the picture here, these are the, uh, we didn't have dedicated group rooms where there were fixed tables where they could sit in groups of four. Some of you are lucky enough to have those. I wrote a grant to get that and it didn't go anywhere. So these are the normal desks we have and we just arrange students into a rough circle. I call these things space pods. Don't they look like little ships? I used to scoot around on them because I have a peculiarly childlike way of looking at the world. Anyhow. Students are sitting in these space pods and the problem is they roll very easily. And without fail, at a couple points during class, I would see somebody start to push away from their group. And when they're physically moving away from their group, without fail, they are disengaging from their group also. And so I never really felt bad about walking over and just gently pushing them back into the center of the group. It's one of the things that took me a while to learn and to recognize that when you see someone physically moving away, uh, if you don't feel comfortable physically pushing them back in, you probably ought to just say something, you know, please move back closer to your group because I need you and your group needs you to be involved. 
I would imagine that as I talk about physical proximity, some of you are thinking, what about online classes, Dave? Of course, online classes are becoming more and more important all the time. So people often ask, you know, how do we recreate this, the value of this collaborative sitting there and talking to each other in an online environment? And sadly, I'm going to tell you, and, and this is my opinion, the answer is uh, you just don't. Um, I believe if anybody tells you that, oh, you can do just as well with group learning in an online class, I just don't think they're being honest with you. It's not going to be as good. doesn't mean it can't be good. It's just not going to be as good. Um, you need to come up with different strategies for fostering that collaboration in an online environment. You can still create a sense of community. And for that, I've found that absolutely the most important thing is the group message boards in our learning management system. What I do in all my online courses is I require that for every single lesson, students make at least two what I call substantive posts to discuss the material. It doesn't count if they just say, hey, this lesson stinks, or man, I had a really good time last weekend. It has to be something along the lines of asking a question about something they don't understand, discussing some of the nuances or the important concepts, answering questions from other students, bouncing ideas back and forth, basically doing the same things that they would do in a synchronous setting if they were physically in the same room or in a Zoom meeting or something like that. But in an online course that is asynchronous, that doesn't work the same way. But you still have to make an effort to convince them that their job is still to work together as a team in this class. You're not going to get what you should out of it if you just sequester yourself in a room and try to work through the materials all on your own. The more time you spend on those message boards, the more time you spend building maybe exterior communities with other students through other social media and so forth, the more you're going to get out of this class, the better you're going to do, and the more you're going to enjoy it. Well, thanks for spending a few minutes of your time with me. I hope you found my suggestions helpful. In my view, one of the most important things to keep in mind when going to collaborative learning is to have fun and be enthusiastic. Your attitude will go a long way in determining your classroom atmosphere. If you're enthused, they'll catch on. Remember, nothing great was ever done without enthusiasm. I remember about a month after I taught my first collaborative class, telling my wife one day, dude, because I call my wife dude, you know, in a regular lecture class, on a good day, I might have one-to-one -one interactions with like five or six students. But in my group classes, I have at least one interaction with every single student every single day. That's a great goal to shoot for. Be kind and be safe. Believe in truth and in justice. Stay in touch and never, ever forget that what you do for a living matters. Bye now.